أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى has given us the توفيق to meet yet again and spend some time reflecting and pondering over the verses of سورة الحجرات in our last session we left off at uh, verse number 12 and we already covered the beginning of the verse and we mentioned in, in this verse there are three instructions and the context of these verses is that Allah Azza wa Jal is speaking about the bond of brotherhood and how to maintain this spirit of brotherhood and sisterhood in the community and in order for us to foster this this type of love and this mutual respect there are certain behaviors that have to be avoided you know when Allah says innam al mu'minuna ikhwa that indeed the believers are nothing but brothers there are certain things that we have to do and there are certain things that we have to avoid in order to preserve this this type of brotherhood in this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he gives three instructions three things that we should avoid in order to keep this this mutual love for one another in our hearts as brothers and sisters in faith number one is that we shouldn't be suspicious of each other that we should be we should think positively of, of one another we shouldn't spy on one another right we shouldn't try to seek out and pursue people's faults and then the third thing that is mentioned and we spoke about that in our last session in detail the last thing that is mentioned in this verse is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wala yaghtab ba'dukum ba'dha Allah says do not backbite each other now what is the definition of backbiting now islamic ethicists they've they've debated over an accurate definition of backbiting so backbiting isn't just to say something negative about someone behind their back you know so for example some of the some scholars have defined backbiting as it's to speak about your fellow brother or sister in faith in a way that would be displeasing to them in their absence however this definition is not accurate because there are some people that might not be happy they may be displeased if you were to 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 praise them you know some of us we also don't, don't like to be praised so defining riba as mentioning your brother or sister in their absence in a way that is displeasing to them that's not an accurate definition because there are many mu'mineen who may be displeased if you were to broadcast their good deeds so we need a better definition of riba and therefore the ulama the islamic ethicists you know looking at the some of the narrations they have defined riba as follows they have said that it is kashfu kashfu aibin mastur riba backbiting the definition of it is to reveal it's to expose a shortcoming that was concealed that was hidden so it's specifically a shortcoming it's something that's negative that was unknown to people and you made it known you exposed it you manifested it so exposing a concealed fault of a fellow brother or sister this is the definition of riba and you find brothers and sisters that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he places a lot of emphasis on protecting each other's reputation Allah doesn't want believers to damage each other's reputation do not backbite one another and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he he mentions the reality of backbiting you know every action has a vahir and it has a batin it has an apparent aspect and it also has a hidden reality 
The same, the same applies to good deeds. Good deeds, they have a vahir and they have a batin. You know, so for example, when when Imam Amir al muminin was praying in Masjid al kufa on the on the 19th of Ramadan, Ibn Muljim, Ibn Muljim, was, Muljim, was, Muljim was also so Amir al muminin they're they're both performing Salatul Fajr. Salatul Fajr is a two rak'ah prayer comprised of recitation of Quran, bowing, prostrating. So the vahir, the apparent action of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and Ibn Muljim was the same. It's the same salah. Umar ibn Sa'ad on the 10th of Muharram and Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, the, the good deed externally is the same. But the hidden reality of those two actions, they're very different. Similarly, sins. There are certain sins that may not seem like a big deal to you. In fact, they may seem attractive to you. You know, there are a lot of people, they won't enjoy a gathering unless there's gossip. They enjoy it. They laugh and they, you know, it's a good time for them. But they don't realize, they don't have that insight. They don't have that basira. They don't see the true nature of this action that they're partaking in. So Allah here, he mentions the gruesome, the, the horrific nature of this action. Allah says, he asks, you know, hypothetically, rhetorically, Would any of you like to consume the flesh, the dead flesh of your brother? Now think about that. That ghiba in the malakut, you know, in the in that world, in that metaphysical world, that's the reality of that action. It's not, you know, it, it would be disgusting to, you know, for someone to be a cannibal, right? But for someone to eat not just human flesh, dead human flesh, it's something that is repulsive. Something that's very repulsive. But you find brothers and sisters, and this is why the Imams, the Prophets, this is why they're infallible. Because they see the reality of these actions. This is why Imam al Hussein, the Prophet, Amir al this is why they don't backbite. Because it's not even tempting to them. Because they see the true nature of these actions. But you and I, you know, we're influenced by shaitan. We're influenced by our own nafs. You know, that's why shaitan, Allah always speaks about how shaitan has to do tazeen. Yuzayyinu lahum a'malam. That shaitan has to beautify sins. Why does he have to beautify? Because they're inherently ugly. That's why we have this concept of tazeen. Shaitan has to beautify sin. Good deeds are inherently beautiful. You know, the Prophet doesn't have to beautify good deeds because they're inherently beautiful. But sins require adornment. They have to be adorned. They have to be beautified because if they're presented in their actual form, they would be repulsive. It would be very abhorrent. And it's unfortunate, brothers and sisters, that gossip and, and backbiting, it's very common among even believers. You know, you might find someone who prays, who has never missed a single prayer. But how many of us can think of someone who has never backbited? You know, that, that's the real achievement. You know, it's good if someone has never missed a prayer. That's commendable. But for someone to say that I have never backbited, how many people do we know like that? How many people have never gossiped? We don't speak negatively about others. If you knew, if you could only see what you're doing, you would avoid it. There are, there's a discussion among the, the ulama regarding uh, 
what do we have to do after we backbite? Because brothers and sisters, the, the damage that we inflict on ourselves from backbiting is incomprehensible to us. There's a, I want to share this hadith with you. I think I maybe I've mentioned it in, uh, maybe when we were speaking about some of the previous surahs that we covered. But in any case, the hadith is from the Prophet. And the Prophet speaks about the Day of Judgment. And there are two types of people that stand before God on the Day of Judgment. The Prophet says, يُؤْتَى بِأَحَدٍ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يُوْقَفُ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَ the Prophet says, on the day of judgment, there will be a man or a, an individual who will stand before God. Now you can imagine how, how nerve-wracking that moment will be. So you're standing for judgment before Allah. You know, think about how nervous you are when you have to go to a district court when you get a ticket. You know, it's a simple traffic violation and you're sweating because you're standing in front of the judge. You're standing before a human judge. Imagine standing before Allah Azza wa Jal. Think about how, how much anxiety we will have on that day. And then the book, the book of our deeds will be presented to us. May Allah protect us. The Prophet says this person will be given his book of deeds. This book represents what your eternal life will be it's not just any book you receive your book of good deeds and you you don't and you don't find your good deeds recorded in them you don't find your hasanat you don't find all of the worship that you've performed you don't find any of these acts of worship so the person protests the person asks فَيَقُولُ إِلَٰهِ لَيْسَ هَذَا كِتَابِي Oh Allah, this is not my book. This is not my book of deeds. فَإِنِّي لَا أَرَى فِيهَا طَاعَتِي Because I don't see any of the good things that I did. فَيُقَالُ لَهُ It will be said to him, إِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَا يَضِلُّ وَلَا يَنْسَى Your Lord does not forget. Your Lord does not make errors. ذَهَبَ عَمَلُكَ بِغْتِيَابِ النَّاسِ that your your good deeds departed they transferred out of your book because because you backbite it you know brothers and sisters if you think about it is it worth it you know we spend so much time praying and reciting the quran and doing reciting these du'as and all it takes all it takes is a moment you sit and you backbite or you listen you know sometimes we think that I was just listening. I wasn't the one who was actively backbiting. I wasn't the one who was saying anything. So am I am I innocent because I was just sitting there? Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, what does he say? He says Kalmughtab that the one who listens to backbiting is equal to the backbiter. So even listening to giving an audience to gossip makes you as guilty before God as the one who backbites. Because gossip needs an audience. You know, if all of us walked out of gatherings where there was gossip, the gossip would end. The reason why gossip and backbiting is, is so common in our communities is because there's an audience for it. There's an audience for it. So, And then there's another person the Prophet mentions on the Day of Judgment. And this person is, is the opposite. You know, they're handed their book of deeds. And they find all of this worship all of these hasanat, all of these righteous deeds that are recorded for them. And you find that this person is honest. This person is honest and says, Ilahi, this is not, this is not my book. 
because I have not performed any of these good deeds. I never went for ziyarah. I didn't recite Quran this much. I didn't pray Salatul Layl. And then it is said to this person that someone backbited. Someone backbited you and you inherited their good deeds. You inherited their good deeds. You know, there's a tradition where the Prophet was once sitting with some uh, some merchants and he was saying, he was asking them, he asked them that, you know, what, who is the bank? Who is the bankrupt person? He's talking to merchants. Mal muflis. Who is bankrupt in your eyes? They say to the Prophet that Ya Rasulullah, Malla dirham alahu wala dina. A bankrupt person is someone who doesn't have a dinar or dirham. Basically, someone who doesn't have any money. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi, says, No, that's not someone who's truly bankrupt. He says, he says, do you want me to tell you who is who who is the true who's truly bankrupt? They said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah. What who is who is bankrupt? The Prophet says to these people, these merchants, these businessmen, that the one who's truly bankrupt is the one who lives a life, prays, fasts, performs hajj. They do all of these good deeds. But they meet Allah Azza wa Jal on the day of judgment. And because they've wronged people, because they've backbited, they are surrounded by people with grievances against them. And on the day of judgment, you can't pay people money. The currency, the currency of the day of judgment are your good deeds. So you backbited this person now to appease them. You, have, you don't give them money, you have to give them hasanat, you have to give them good deeds from your record. You owe this person money. You compensate them now with good deeds. And this is why Imam Zainul Abideen in Dua Abi Hamza Thumari, which inshallah we recited in the month of Ramadan, he mentions this. He says, وَمِنْ أَيْدِ الْخُصَمَاءِ غَدًا مَنْ يُخَلِّصُنِي Oh Allah, who is going to save me on the day of judgment from those who have a right against me? People that I've wronged. So backbiting, it's one of those sins, one of those dangerous sins, where not only are you damaging the person's reputation, you're damaging first and foremost your own soul. You're wiping out your good deeds. And we cannot afford to pass out our hasanat on that day. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, you know, today I was looking at some of the ahadith there was a group of companions. They backbited in the presence of the Prophet. And if you look at the way that they speak, you and I would probably not even think that it's backbiting. So the hadith says, a group of companions, The companions were with the Prophet. And they mentioned a man was another companion of the Prophet. And they were basically saying that he doesn't eat until he's fed. Basically he's spoiled. And he doesn't go anywhere until his horse, until his mount is ready. So they're basically saying that, you know, he's kind of, you know, he lives the high life. He's, he's spoiled. فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ اِغْتَبْتُمُوهُ That you backbited against him. Because this quality, him being spoiled, was not known, that was not public knowledge. People didn't know that he was like that. You exposed something about him that was unknown. But what did they say? What did the companions say? They say, يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِنَّمَا حَدَّثْنَا بِمَا فِيهِ they say, Ya Rasulullah, but it's true. You know, sometimes when you catch people backbiting and you say, no, no, don't talk about them. You say, no, no, but it's true. I have evidence, right? They say to the Prophet, it's true. He is spoiled. He is, he is like that. The Prophet said, if it's true, it's ghibah. If it's false, it's buhtan, it's slander, which is even worse. So ghibah, backbiting, 
is to say something that is true. It's true that this person might have these shortcomings. They might commit these sins, but it's not public knowledge. Why are you exposing them? Do you want Allah to expose you? Don't you have your own crimes and sins that you've committed? Do you want Allah to expose you? And this is where Imam Al-Kadhim salam he gives a very beautiful uh, definition of uh, of ghibah. Imam Al-Kadhim salam says, "Man dhakara rajulan min khalfihi bima huwa fi mimma arafahu nas lam yaghtabu." If you mention something about someone that is negative, but it's public knowledge, it's known, it's not ghibah. Now it might be haram for another reason. If your intention is to, you know, damage this person's reputation, that's it could be haram for another reason. But because it's not, but because it's it's known, it's public knowledge, it's not ghiba. وَمَنْ ذَكَرَهُ مِنْ خَلْفِهِ بِمَا هُوَ فِيهِ مِمَّا لَا يَعْرِفُهُ النَّاسِ اغْتَابَ But mentioning something that is true. But it's not known to people, right? It's not known to people. That is riba, exposing a shortcoming that is concealed. That is the definition of riba. Now the question is that if someone backbites, am I required to go and ask them for forgiveness? Because brothers and sisters, you know, sins, there are certain sins that are between you and Allah. You miss Salatul Fajr intentionally. That's a sin. That is Haqqullah that you violated. You didn't uphold God's right. What do you do? You ask Allah for forgiveness. And Allah is Allah is pretty lenient when it comes to forgiveness about issues relating to His right over you. Haqqullah. But there are certain sins where it's a combination of haqqullah and haqqun nas. So when you backbite, for example, you have violated the law of God. You have not upholded God's right. And additionally, you have violated the rights of another person. So there are two issues here, haqqullah and haqqun nas. Now, some fuqaha, they say that you have to ask them, for forgiveness it's not enough to just make toba but this again this is a, a an area of uh, of contention and dispute among scholars some scholars say that ask them for forgiveness in general say that I, I i i wronged you and i want you to forgive me because some of the fuqaha they say if you go into details about what you said it will increase the animosity between you and this is not what islam wants so if you can ask for forgiveness without increasing the animosity between you and that person, then do so. So for example, imagine someone knows what you said. Then you should go and ask that person for forgiveness. But if the person doesn't know, and there's a high chance that you telling them about what you did and how you gossiped about them, if you think that that is only going to create more malice and more contempt between you two, they're going to hate you even more. Then ask them for forgiveness in a general way. Say that I've wronged you. I ask you to please forgive me. And if you think that they're going to probe you, then keep it as general as you can. You know, please, you know, forgive me if I've wronged you in any way. Now, that's the route that you should take. Now, suppose that you have to ask someone for forgiveness and you don't know where they are. You cannot locate them. What you have to do in this case, and this happens sometimes. You, you met people years ago and you've lost contact with them. You should make an effort to try to get in touch with them. But if you can't, suppose they passed away or you have no way of reaching them. How do you, how do you make amends with people that you've backbited against whom you cannot reach because of death or because of distance or because of circumstances? You do a good deed in their name. You pay charity on their behalf. If they passed away, you give charity on their behalf. You make dua for them. You do a good deed on their behalf. And on the day of judgment, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through that good deed, He will please them. 
He will please them through that action that you did, that Allah will try to kind of compensate them. We have to take these issues seriously. You know, sometimes we spend so much time focusing on other fiqh issues where these are also important fiqh issues. You have to ask your marja that am I obligated to go and ask for the, for forgiveness from this person directly? So this is also a, uh, a fiqh issue. وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا أَنْ يُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكِرِهْتُمُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَوَّابٌ رَحِيمٌ So it's not, so it, it won't be considered ghiba, but it could be, it will be considered haram for another reason. إِذَاءُ الْمُؤْمِنِ Hurting another believer. So if that's going to hurt them or embarrass them or damage their reputation, then it's haram. It's not ghiba, but it's haram for another reason. So just because, you know, and sometimes people say that, and this is also another common, you know, uh, justification, you know, when you say to someone that maybe we shouldn't talk about someone behind their back, they say, what do they usually say? Shaykh, I'll say that to, to their face as if it becomes halal. So yeah, if you say it to their face, it's not ghiba, but it's haram for another reason. Because you're not, you're not allowed to say things that are hurtful to people. You're not allowed to say things with the intention of belittling and exposing and damaging people's reputation. So it's not ghiba, but it's haram for another reason, which is idha ul About someone's good deeds, that's uh, that's not considered uh, ghiba. Because as I mentioned, ghiba is to expose a concealed shortcoming. So a good deed is not a shortcoming. So that would not be uh, that would not be considered uh, ghiba. In fact, that's probably something good, you know, to kind of you know mention the good things that people are doing, especially if your niyyah is to kind of, you know, praise the person and to elevate their uh, reputation. But I mean, at the same time, I think that it's important for us not to be, and this is something that the Ahlul Bayt teach that, you know, don't be lavish in your praise of anyone and don't be too sharp in your criticism. You know, be try to be very balanced. You know, don't be too, too, you know, uh, so we don't go to any to either one of the extremes, but there's no problem in uh, in you know mentioning uh, the good that people do.